The causes of suffering are of two kinds. Those that go away when you look at them steadily, and those that don't. It's because of the first kind that some people think that that's the solution to every problem that comes up in the mind. Just look at it steadily. Be with it, and it will dissolve away on its own. The problem is there are other, the other kind of cause of suffering. That requires that you, as the Buddha says, exert a fabrication. This is why it's good to know about those three kinds of fabrication that we talk about so much, bodily, verbal, mental. Bodily is the way you breathe. Verbal is the way you talk to yourself. The Buddha terms it directed thought and evaluation. You bring up a topic in your mind, and then you talk about it, comment on it, ask questions about it. And then finally there's mental fabrication, perceptions, the images you hold in mind, or individual words to identify things, and then feelings, feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. It's through these three kinds of fabrication that we shape our experience. And when things go wrong in the mind, it's because we're doing it in ignorance. So we want to bring some knowledge to it. When things are not going well in the meditation, keep this framework in mind. Sometimes the problem is with the way you breathe. Sometimes it's with the way you talk to yourself, the things you focus on, and the comments you make. Then there are the perceptions, the lizard brain messages, where you identify, well, this must be that, and that must be this, this must mean that, that must mean this. And people can drive themselves crazy, primarily with the verbal and mental fabrication, but even bodily fabrication. Some people, when they meditate, get strong feelings of energy suddenly flowing through the body. Usually these are people who've had a lot of repressed energy. You sit down and meditate, and all of a sudden the lid goes off the pressure cooker and things explode. Or something comes up and you make up your mind, well, this must mean this, that must mean that. You talk to yourself about what's going on. And if you're not careful, you can create lots of really strange states. The Buddha recognized that meditation can dig up unskillful thoughts in the mind, unskillful states. But he had a solution for them. It comes down to how you breathe, how you talk to yourself, and the perceptions and feelings you focus on. The most famous case was of the monks who were practicing body contemplation without any supervision. The Buddha had gone off on a personal retreat into the forest, and they got so disgusted with their bodies that they ended up committing suicide. The Buddha came out of his re retreat, noticed that there were a lot fewer monks around, so he called the remaining monks together. He said, when anything unskillful comes up in the mind as you meditate, or if the meditation is aggravating unskillful thoughts, switch back to the breath. Then he listed the sixteen steps of breath meditation, which you didn't just sit with whatever was coming up. You actively tried to counteract it. If the mind was too energetic, you would breathe in a way that would calm it down. was getting too depressed, you'd breathe in a way that would encourage it, enliven it, gladden it. If there's too much energy coursing through the body, you would calm that down as well. If the breath was tight and unpleasant, figure out some way to breathe that would bring more pleasure. 
In other words, when something really unskillful comes up, use breath meditation as a way of dealing with these three, form, three forms of fabrication and find the antidote. The Buddha lists five different ways of dealing with unskillful thoughts, and they're basically different ways of engaging in fabrication. With each of them he gives you an image, which is a perception to hold in mind about what you do to counteract unskillful things. Sometimes you simply note that something unskillful has come up and you turn the mind to something that's more skillful. He says that's like driving a large peg out with a small peg. Or you can reflect on the unskillful consequences of a particular kind of thinking until you develop a sense of shame around it, a sense of disgust, a sense of wanting to be rid of it. In the same way that someone who likes beauty looks in the mirror and sees, oh, someone's hung a dead snake around me, how they would feel about that dead snake. Or you can decide that you're simply not going to pay attention to that kind of thing. It can chatter away in one corner of the mind. But you're not going to go there. You're not going to get involved in the chatter. He says it's like someone who sees something he doesn't like, and so he turns his eyes away. Or you can notice how the unskillful thought requires energy, requires a kind of fabrication which is both verbal and bodily. There's a bodily side to every thought. A little pattern of tension. Okay, you breathe through that, you relax that. The same way that a person standing might say, why don't I sit down? Or a person sitting down says, why don't I lie down? Or if all else fails, you just put your tongue against the roof of your mouth, grit your teeth, and say, well, not think that thought. You beat down the mind, the Buddha says, in the same way that two strong men might beat down a weaker man. In other words, you don't just sit there with whatever's coming up and look at it. You have a policy for how not to get entangled, how not to get involved. And you use those three kinds of fabrication. In other passages where the Buddha says, if you find thoughts of regret come up, things you've done in the past that you feel really bad about, realize the best thing you can do is to resolve not to repeat the mistake. And to engage in Brahma-Vihara meditation. Think thoughts of goodwill for everybody. Thoughts of compassion, thoughts of empathetic joy, thoughts of equanimity. Try to make your mind unlimited so that the, the pain of having made a mistake like that doesn't overwhelm you. The important thing to realize is that whatever unskillful things come up in the mind, there's always a skillful antidote. In some cases, the Buddha just indicates a, in, in a general way what it might be. In other cases, it's more specific. But you can take his indications and work with them. And realizing if something unskillful comes into the mind, it is a type of karma, and it may come from past karma. But you've got the possibility of making choices in the present moment. This is the most important thing you've got to keep in mind. There are some forms of meditation that tell you you have no choice. Whatever comes up, you just have to accept it. And that gives you no motivation for looking for a, an antidote, and leaves you, as the Buddha says, unprotected. Then we have to remember that meditation is safe. But it's safe when you do it right. If you go off the tracks, the Buddha doesn't guarantee. It's like the image he has of some people taking a cart along a road. As long as they stay on the road, the cart is not going to fall apart. 
But if they go off the road and start going up a mountain, the path up the mountain is uneven, and they end up with a broken wheel, a broken axle. In other words, if you let the mind wander away in line with whatever thoughts come up, whatever interpretations come up, there's no guarantee. But if you have a good governor inside, one that can see it when the mind is going off course and you can self-correct, that's when you're following the teachings, because the teachings give you all kinds of ways of correcting yourself. It's simply a matter of knowing them and using them. There's a pun that a John Fuang used to say, or used to employ. The word ben in Thai means to be, but also means to be capable. It also means to have symptoms. So some symptoms come up in the meditation. And he would say, don't be afraid of that. What you're afraid of is that you're, you're not capable of doing the meditation. In other words, that you don't really do it. You do it, things may come up that will surprise you sometimes. It may create some difficulties. But every difficulty that comes up in the meditation can be cured. So approach this with a sense of heedfulness. Because after all, we do have we all have a little bit of craziness in our in our makeup, the way we talk to ourselves, or the way we focus on certain images, certain ideas, certain interpretations. You have to be willing to place all of your ways of thinking and engaging in different kinds of fabrication under the Buddha's microscope. If you were looking at the way you're breathing, if you were looking at the way you're talking to yourself, if you're here looking at the perceptions and feelings you're focused on, what would he say? When you come up with but it seems like a good solution, give it a try. But then, remember, you're giving it a try. Our problem is that we're all coming from ignorance. And the only way we're going to learn is to be willing to make experiments and to learn how to recognize when an experiment is not going well. You get a better and better sense of how you make it go right. It's a meditation as it digs down into the mind. Sometimes we'll dig up some things that you'd rather just leave untouched. But if you don't deal with them, they're just going to stay there. But the Buddha gives you the tools you need to deal with them. It's simply a matter of learning how to master them, recognizing the tools. And have a good framework in the back of the mind. Part of that framework is not just a, an intellectual framework. It's the framework that comes from the practice of generosity and the practice of virtue. The qualities of not only the mind but also the heart. They keep you on course. This is why the Buddha taught meditation as part of a larger path, an eightfold path. It's not it's just a one or twofold path. Virtue, and as I said, generosity is part of the prerequisites for the path. You're not going to get into jhana without generosity, he said. So try to keep everything in the context, both the analytical context of how the mind fabricates things. And in the heart context, as someone who's got a lot of goodwill, and 
when you keep the whole context in mind, you realize what the Buddha said at one point is true. There's nothing lacking in the path. There's nothing in excess. There are no unnecessary folds in the path. And the path doesn't need any folds added to it. Eightfold is just right. 